we go. Um, welcome to the final day of DevOx. Uh, my name is Ben Stopford, and um, today I'm going to be talking to you about building event-driven services with Apache uh, Kafka and Kafka Streams. Um, so I work at a company um, called Confluent. Anyone heard of Confluent? Oh, we've got a fair few. That's pretty good. Um, what about Apache Kafka? Hands up for Apache Kafka. Got a few more for that. OK, awesome. So um, Confluent is the company that sits behind Apache Kafka. So we basically provide like support, and there's a sort of open source ecosystem um, behind this uh, um, open source streaming platform. And if you haven't come across Kafka before, we'll, we'll be talking a bit about it today. And that's essentially what it is. It's an um, open source streaming platform. And it's probably most well known for the distributed log, which is a sort of messaging system, a very scalable messaging system that sits at the start, at the center um, of this platform. So um, I actually work as an engineer uh, for most of the time on um, Apache, Core, Apache Kafka Core, the log. And um, I've done some stuff like uh, uh, data balancing, um, I did the latest version of the replication protocol, stuff like that. Um, so if you want to ask me very technical questions, you can come up at the end. I'll be very happy to answer those. But this talk is really about thinking about how we apply these technologies um, to building services, um, distributed business applications, and um, really just using these stream processing tools. So when we build... Um, when we build software, just kind of taking a step back, when we build software, we um, have a couple of different masters. One of these is kind of very intuitive and very tangible. It's the idea that we just build features, right? The use, our, our users, they want stuff done, so we oblige and we build software which does things that they want, whether it's putting information on screens or letting people buy iPads or whatever it might be. But as software engineers, we actually have another hat that we wear. And that other hat is really this idea that we're thinking about the fact that our software needs to last. Right? So why do you modularize your code? Why do you implement unit tests? Um, why do you do continuous integration or continuous delivery? All these things are practices which you apply because you know your software needs to last. And software lasting doesn't mean it sits on some file system in GitHub. It means you can evolve it in real time. And actually, when we build systems, this property that a system needs to be able to evolve is actually as important in system design as it is in software engineering. So this, this concept of evolution is very important. And hopefully, through this talk, we'll see that one of the things that taking this kind of event-driven model helps you with, the other one is actually scale, which is, will hopefully be pretty apparent. But one, the other thing that it helps you with is this ability to evolve. So streaming platforms, um, they come from a, a particular background. And um, a streaming platform looks something like this, it's sort of a canonical use case. So. You all have, I'm sure, a mobile phone in your pocket. Um, that mobile phone will have a number of applications on it, which will be sending um, packets back to uh, various servers for the applications that you um, have running. It also have an operating system, so that will be sending data back to, let's say, Apple or Google or whatever phone you have. And um, these data sets get very large. And they're, they're quite small messages, right? So when you open an application, it sends a little message to Apple or a message to Google. And you can't have lots and obviously lots of these, of these messages um, passing in real time. So these data sets get pretty large. So you th you're thinking of the order of um, about uh, 100 terabytes a day of what are very small messages. And um, a streaming platform lets you collect that information in Apache Kafka, which I said is, is this kind of messaging system. And then it also lets you process that data. And the reason that it's important to process this in a streaming way is because the data set is so large. So in a streaming way, 
you, um, you perform some kind of computation and you perform that computation incrementally. So rather than you might, with a sort of database or a batch oriented model, you'd sort of collect all the data, you'd let it build up over time, and then at some point you sort of run a query across the whole thing. Where streaming is about kind of continuously computing a result. And when you have these big, fast data sets, this is sort of a necessity. So in this kind of architecture, we'd have, we'd land this large data set into Kafka, we'd process it with this stream processing layer, which sits in the middle, and then we'd typically put it into some serving layer. And the reason we need the serving layer is that everything that's happening in the streaming platform is asynchronous. Right, so messages are flying around. There's actually typically multiple stages so you'll have multiple steps, and actually messages will move between different instances of the streaming engine. And um, at some point, you want to bridge that kind of asynchronous divide with a sort of more synchronous divide, where I can run, run queries to get, you know, to get the, the results that you need. So that's why you put it in a serving layer. So there's a few things here. There's a, there's a high throughput messaging system. The stream processing layer is optimized for scale. And also this idea of data locality. So one of the things that uh, stream processing does to enable scaling is it has some primitives for bringing data inside each engine. And that's, um, that's very important um, because uh, it stops the whole engine coupling around a single data source. And then finally, if you're using Kafka Streams, which is the um, streaming API, which just ships with Apache Kafka. It's just literally one of the APIs that you can program against. Um, and you can build a streaming layer with that. Um, that's literally just a Java app, right? So it's, a, it's an API, public, static, void, main, and you just start a new KStreams instance, and then you start playing with these streams that live in Kafka. So that's just like a little overview of what a streaming platform looks like. So let's try and get an idea of what stream processing is, because it's not always the most intuitive concept. So imagine that we have a set of authorization attempts, and like, so we've got um, uh, various people around the world are using their credit cards, and we're interested in, we're interested in looking for fraudulent, um, fraudulent attempts. So somebody using a credit card, the same credit card, um, many times in a short period of time. It's a very, very simple streaming example. So we've got authorization attempts coming in, people using their card, and possible fraud coming out. So we can express this as a query in a language called KSQL, which is, as you can probably guess if you're familiar with SQL, quite similar to SQL. Um, and this is one of the APIs um, over Apache Kafka, uh, over Apache Kafka uh, streaming platform. So, What's this actually doing? Well, firstly, we're taking in a constant stream of authorization attempts. And then we're creating an output stream. So these are potential fraudulent transactions. And we're defining that as selecting the credit card number with a count over a five minute window. And this idea of a window is really important. We're going to talk about it a little bit more later. But this is how we break an infinite stream up into something that we can reason about. OK, so it's over a five minute tumbling window. And then we're going to group by the card number and then filter with a having clause, a count more than three. So within a five minute window, and that window will basically move in time, we're going to constantly look for any credit card which, which has had more than, th than uh, three attempts. So streaming is really this idea of having a tool set, and it's actually quite a rich tool set, which lets you manipulate data in flight. So this is a kind of very simple, that was a very simple example, we just had one stream in and one stream coming out. But you can actually join multiple streams together, you can then um, and you can buffer those, you can perform computation on those. Um, for example, maps, reduces, all of the sort of things you see in the sort of Java Streams API. Though all of those, those APIs are available, and you can kind of add any functionality that you wish. Send emails, 
call out to other servers, um, perform very complicated machine learning algorithms. Okay, so that was a bit about streaming. What's this got to do with business applications? Let's take a look at this. Well, increasingly today we tend to build ecosystems. Right, so we're, whether we're a startup, for a startup we're quite likely to start with a single monolithic application, um, but pretty soon we're probably going to want to bring in some other kind of uh, application or scale out over multiple machines for some reason. Likewise, if we work in a big company, we probably have a load of applications already. So we have to think about how we're going to join those things together. And over the years, there have been a number of different patterns for doing this. Um, today, microservices are pretty popular. Um, before them, there was service-oriented architectures and event-driven architectures. But these are, they're all, they're all, these are all sort of slightly different patterns for working out how to join a set of independent processes together so that they further some common goal. So in this instance, this is a sort of microservices example where we have um, we've divided our domain up into a bunch of services which have single responsibilities. So the problem with service architectures tends to be around data. Um, so let's take, um, I'm going to use uh, an online retail example quite a lot during this particular talk. Um, so imagine, you know, Amazon or you're buying iPads from Apple or something like that. So let's say we have this, this kind of architecture where we have, um, we've segregated responsibilities. So we have orders information inside the order service. We have customer information inside the customer service. Maybe the product catalog lives inside the stock service, or maybe it has its own service. But suffice to say that we have all these data sets and we locate them inside the services that own them. That makes a lot of sense. So, um, and we can obviously, have we maybe expose a REST interface on each of these services so that we can get at this data. But the kind of important point is that um, these data sets, the customers, orders, the product catalog, we're going to need them in a whole range of different services. So when we look at the shipping service, which is the service which is going to take an iPad from the warehouse and get it to your door, it's going to need access to these data sets to do its work. It needs to know customer information so that it knows where to ship your parcel to, etc. So how do we share data between services? So if we simplify this model a little bit, we have a simple web application, and it's talking to an order service and a customer service. Um, so if we buy an iPad, we make a call to the order service, and that would talk to the shipping service, which could also talk to the customer service, and shipping service would get the iPad to our door. So the simplest way to do this is with REST, or gRPC, or whatever your request response style protocol of choice. Um, and so the web server would, um, so we buy an iPad, and we, the order would be submitted to the order service. And then the order service would have some, probably some service discovery mechanism, which allowed it to work out where the shipping service was, and it would make a call to the shipping service to say, you need to send this to this person. And the shipping service would then make a call to the customer service to work out where to send it to. What's the address of this particular user? So get customer, and then off it goes. So this is, this is OK. This all works quite well. A um, couple of things make this slightly more difficult in practice, and that is when these call graphs get very complex. Um, so notably, uh, it's when the call graphs actually add uh, several layers of depth. So when, once we have services which are effectively chained to one another. And one of the main reasons for that is that um, each service becomes very dependent on the performance of another. So for example, when I submit an iPad, right, I actually just want that to come back as quickly as possible. I want to know that it's going to be shipped to me, but, I, but I don't, that service doesn't actually need to be responsible for making a call to the shipping service. Like if the shipping service not, isn't running, you kind of, the order service has got to like buffer and keep trying until the shipping service is back up again. So the way people get around that problem is using um, an event-driven model. And um, an event-driven models are slightly different. And 
there's, there's sort of pros and cons here. You can, use, you can mix these two models together. Um, but I think it's just important to understand what the trade-offs are. So in the event-driven model, um, the order would be submitted in exactly the same way. Right? We're still going to make some kind of REST call or WebSocket or something. And so we make a call to the order service. But this time, the order service doesn't actually know anything about any other services. All it does is it raises an event order created. Okay, and it sends that to a messaging system. And I've used Kafka because I work on Kafka. Um, you could use any messaging system you wanted at this point. It doesn't matter. Um, so suffice to say, some kind of publish, publish, subscribe messaging system will work wonderfully here. So the order gets created, and the shipping service would subscribe to this order. And um, uh, it could then respond, start the shipping process. Likewise, we have this sort of customer service. Um, the customer service can do the same thing. So when a customer updates their information, it creates an event. And that event gets sent to the broker, and the broker transmits it around. But there's something interesting about this idea of an event. And that is that it has a kind of duality. So on one side, an event is a notification. It's a call for action, a call that somebody needs to do something. And it's actually decoupling the two services. So the order service has no idea who's going to use the order created event. The shipping service is the one that subscribes to that event. So we have this concept of notification. The second point is that the event itself includes data. Right? So the event is the order. It's a fact. So the second part of events is, is that it's this other side of this duality is that it's, abil it's an ability for us to move data around the architecture. It's a mechanism for replicating data because the data is actually inside the event. So in the customer case, you may not update. I mean, when was the last time you changed your address? Probably the last time you moved house. That might have been a couple of years ago. So um, there's not going to be any correlation between the events coming from the order service or the events coming from the customer service. So in an event-driven model, you would store that event in a database. So you'd basically have a, you'd use that as a replication stream. So we have these kind of two notions of events and two ways that we can use them. So on one side, we can literally just use them for notification and the decoupling properties that come with that, actually, and scalability properties that come with that because we're moving into this asynchronous world. So if we just used it for notification, we would, the order service would submit the event, but actually the shipping service would make a synchronous call to the customer service to work out where it needs to send each parcel. But also we can use this other side, we can use the data replication side, where we're actually optimizing for data locality. Right? So in this model, customer information is replicated through events, into a database in the shipping service. So you're effectively using it almost to tie these kind of two databases together. And that means that the customer, sorry, the shipping service is going to make that query locally. So there's kind of these two hats. There's this notification hat and there's this replication hat. And we kind of we can use whichever ones we wish. So Events actually provide an important key to building scalable ecosystems because they provide notification, they decouple services, but they also move you into this asynchronous world. And in an asynchronous world, you can run many things concurrently. Streaming is the tool set for dealing with these events on the move. So streaming is all about dealing with these streams of events that th flow through a system, slicing and dicing them, moving data to different services, and performing computations efficiently across multiple machines. So let's create, take a quick look at Kafka. Um, so Kafka, as I said, is a streaming platform, and it has a few different components. I'm just going to touch on what, what each of these are. 
And then after that, we're going to look at how we actually build up an event-driven services ecosystem. So at the core is a, the log, a distributed log. Um, and a distributed log uh, is a type of messaging system. So you put a message in, it goes to a topic, other people can subscribe, subscribe to that topic. Topic could be orders. So the interesting thing about uh, Kafka's distributed log is um, it has no bottlenecks. So if we have sort of producing services on the left, so we've got three of those, we've got four consuming services, and we've got Kafka, which we'll, we'll say is running over, whatever, five machines or something. So it, it would be anything between typically three, although you can run it on one, but typically three or um, uh, hundreds is about as big as Kafka clusters get. So the important point here is that you can scale this at any layer. There is no bottleneck anywhere within the system. So you can write data in, and when you write a message, um, it's actually rooted to a particular shard, and we call them partitions. And that partition will live on a particular machine. And within that partition, you have very strong ordering guarantees. So that partition is actually, when you read it on the consuming side, what actually happens is a partition is allocated to a single consumer, and then their effects, these partitions are effectively handed out, and that's how consuming services read. So we can scale this architecture out linearly at any single layer. So this would be, these, in this case, these consuming services would be spreading the data set across them. And it's actually that, it's this architecture which allows you to deal with those very high throughput workloads that we talked at, about right at the start of the talk, when we're talking about Apple and Google and stuff. So each shard is a queue, and compute, consumers can share load across themselves by effectively, because they're, um, they, have each, they have individual um, partitions, shards assigned to them. And if one of those goes down, it just automatically recovers. And that's actually at every, at, in every single layer. So what, one of the, the side effects of this is that your ordering is based on a partition. That's your ordering guarantee. So if we were processing orders and an order has a life cycle, like it's created and then it becomes validated and then maybe it gets shipped, like we want to make sure that there was an ordering guarantee across that life cycle. So what we do is we just assign that, the order ID to the key, and that way it would always be rooted to the same partition. Um, but what if we need global ordering? Well, in, if we need global ordering, we actually just create a topic which has a single partition. That means it would only run on one machine, so it would go back to being just like a normal message broker, like uh, Tibco or RabbitMQ or, or whatever. Um, so we can always go back to this global ordering property if we want. We just sacrifice an element of scalability, but we get all of the, of the um, resiliency properties. So we can use this in the service architecture to, to, to do a few things. Um, we can load balance our services. So we can obviously have multiple instances of a service running at one time. And in, if one of these services fails, there'll be a very short pause and it will... Um, and data will be rerouted to the surviving service. So you can effectively load balance, as well as provide fault tolerance. And um, this fault tolerance actually exists not only in the service layer, but also inside the broker itself. So the Kafka broker replicates data across different machines, so that if any single machine fails, then it will just automatically recover. And what this means is that you can run a system always on. So for example, um, so, uh, Kafka came from LinkedIn originally. That's where it was built. And LinkedIn uses, unsurprisingly, quite a lot of Kafka as a result. Um, and they don't take their services down. So these Kafka clusters run all the time. Um, if they need to do a release, then they simply um, do a kind of rolling bounce where they stop a machine upgrade it, start the new machine, start the old machine, and the whole thing kind of cycles across. So there are a couple of other properties which we need to focus on. One is this idea that we can um, rewind and replay the log. So 
The log is actually unlike a traditional messaging system. It's literally an append-only data structure. And you can keep very large data sets in Kafka as a result. So it's not uncommon to have topics with hundreds of terabytes of data inside them. And that means you can keep data effectively indefinitely. So if you're, it's not just, you can use it not just as a messaging system for moving data around, you can actually use it as a storage system. And then rewind back to the start and replay data in the order that it achieved, it, it was created. So this gives this very interesting and useful primitive for backing a service ecosystem. And then finally, I won't touch on this too much, but there's this, this I have to mention it, there's this thing called a compacted log, and this is a, effectively a log. So a log is immutable by, the, by default. Every single message will be kept. Sometimes you actually don't want to have every single message. And the main reason that you don't want to have every single message is because you want to move that data around. And when you want to move it around, you kind of want it to be as small as possible. So you can compact it based on a key. And a compacted log ends up looking like a table in a database, effectively. So that's the log. Um, that sort of sits at the core of the platform. Next are connectors. I'm not going to spend much time on these. These are a pretty intuitive idea. Um, we have a, co a connector, and um, it allows us to pull data from a database and turn what is off typically um, mutable state, you can turn that into an event stream of every single change that the database made. And then we can put that through Kafka. And then on the other side, we can take that event stream and put it back into a, into a database. And there's a bunch of kind of off-the-shelf connectors on the Confluent site which connect to pretty much any database that you can imagine. The nice thing about these um, more contemporary connectors, particularly the ones on the left, the ones that suck data out of a database, is they use this thing called CDC, which is change data capture. And that's a very efficient way of getting data out of a database because it doesn't sort of go in the front door. It, it basically latches in on the transaction log um, the bin log which sits underneath the database and journals everything, everything that it does. And it turns that into an event stream. So it doesn't put too much operational overhead on the database. So finally, um, I wanted to talk about streaming engine. And so Kafka Streams is a database engine for data in flight. Um, so we saw this kind of query earlier. Um, so very SQL-like, we can do group buys. Um, actually, if we're using the Java API, we have all of these sort of map, transform, peak functions as well, so we can do anything that Java can do. Um, so we can run these, these queries continually. We can join data sets together. We can apply windows to allow us to reason about um, infinite streams. We can then transform into views, so in a services model, that often means turning some message format into our own domain model, and then applying filters, where clauses, aggregates on top of that. But this kind of window, this idea of windows is quite important. So imagine I have like a, an emailing service. Um, then, and I'm, I'm working in an asynchronous world, so I want to send an email to a user when their order when they create an order, but also that order is paid. So you can imagine there's going to be some kind of order event and some kind of payment event. And you might think there would be some, some um, uh, that one of these would turn up before the other. Um, in an asynchronous world, there's no way for you to know which of these two are going to turn up first. Because it could be delayed on the network, there could be a whole host of reasons why the order might turn, for, turn up first, or the payment might turn up first. So you need to join these two things together. And this is kind of what, um, uh, so this is what a window kind of helps you with. Strictly speaking, I should say, there are two concepts here. There's windows and retention. They're very slightly different, but for, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to treat them as the same. So we can use a window to allow us to join these two things together. And this helps us deal with this asynchronous world. Now, I'll put a five minute buffer there. So what the streaming engine's actually gonna have to do is it's gonna have to buffer these events for five minutes. 
and work out whether or not when a new event comes in, whether or not there was a correlating event, which is going to join together and then send an email. And Kafka streams actually will buffer this data onto disk. And there's a reason for that, which is that you quite often want to have quite long windows. This, this idea of um, buffering can be extended to something that's actually slightly more powerful, which is a table. So let's say we want to do something like that example we had before, where we want to join, we, want, we have orders and payments, but we also want to join customer information. So orders and payments, they're correlated in, in real time, right? They're not going to happen at exactly the same time. We don't know which order they're going to turn up in, but we do know they're going to happen at about the same time. We have no idea when the customer last updated his customer information. But what we can do here is we can basically create a window, which is actually a retention, which goes on forever, that starts from offset zero. And remember, Kafka is a storage system as well as a messaging system. So we can actually store that customer information in Kafka. And what this means is that we're effectively going to join these two buffered streams, orders and payments, with a table of customer information. And we're going to do that inside the email of service. Right, so this is all happening inside this API. Gonna, so we can blend these concepts of streams and tables. And this, um, this leads to this quite important consequence that we're able to optimize for data locality. We're able to push data to where it's needed. So in a stateful stream processing engine, um, we can have a stream, we might have a compacted stream, and we can push data to a service. So this would be the Kafka Streams API on the left. And we can join multiple streams together, and we can join tables as well, these complete result sets, like all of the customers that we have. And one of the main things that a streaming platform does is it optimizes to solve this particular problem. It optimizes for data locality and helps you scale this problem where you need more retention and ensures that you don't have to spend a long time rebuilding these views if things go wrong. So if we want to store the customers, if the customers don't fit on one machine, we can spread them across multiple machines. We can scale this topology out. And this is all happening, this is all happening kind of out of sight inside the API. Literally, when you write this code, you literally just write a stream, you open a stream, much like that SQL statement we had at the start, um, and you just process that stream. If you create a table, it will just buffer that table locally, it will load the data if it hasn't already got it, et cetera, et cetera. So streaming is about a couple of things. It's about processing data incrementally. So rather than putting it into a database and computing it in batch, it's about constantly processing data as it happens, as it arrives, constantly reacting to the world. And that's that sort of notification side of events. Remember we were talking about events earlier. Right, so events have this notification hat. But then we also have that replication hat, that fact that an event is really a fact, and that fact is moving, can be moved from one service to another. So stream processing is all, also about optimizing for moving data to where it needs to be quickly. So that's the streaming platform. We didn't really talk about the producer and the consumer in the top. They are just very simple APIs for getting data in and out of Kafka. OK, so we talked a little bit about streaming. We talked a little bit about streaming uh, platforms. Let's talk a little bit about how we build services. So this, um, in this section, we're basically going to go through 10 steps um, and involve a little microservices ecosystem um, based on this technology. So the first thing is to start simple and take responsibility, take responsibility for the past and evolve forwards. So quite often you'll be starting with some kind of legacy application or some kind of monolith um, and you'll typically evolve forwards. 
we might split out an order service which we talk to. And as we talked to, as we discussed before, um, one way we can do this is to use events rather than talking to services. And the reason we do that is because of this duality. We want to leverage this duality of events, the fact that they provide decoupling via notification, but also a mechanism for us to localize state when we need to. So instead of talking directly to services, we can raise events. In this case, the web server will journal an order received event, just like the previous example, and it'll be picked up by the order service. Now, we need to obviously evolve a workflow forwards, right? And an order can go through a variety of different states. So in this model, um, the, the user would request the iPad, the order would be received, it would be picked up by the order service, and then the order service would um, validate the order and then raise a new event called order validated. And in this model, anyone who obviously wants to listen to that can listen to that. So we're, we're totally decoupling ourselves. This has actually got a name. It's called receiver-driven flow control. And it basically equates to pluggability in your architecture. So the next thing we can do is we can use the Connect API um, and that cool change data capture thing to evolve away from legacy. This is a very common thing to do. So let's say in our database we have um, the product catalog and we actually need the product catalog to be available both as a data set but also as an event stream. Then we can literally just attach it onto the bottom of, of this legacy database and we can suck out the product catalog anytime it gets updated inside the legacy system. It will obviously get pushed into this event stream and we can actually leave that data in Kafka if we want to. So four is about making use of schemas. Um, so typically, you don't have to do this, but it is a good idea. Um, and that is when we move data around, whenever we particularly do fire and forget messaging, um, we want to kind of wrap it in some form of schema. And the reason to do this is mainly backwards compatibility. So if I'm the order service and I'm subscribing to events, I kind of want to know that they're always going to be compatible with my software. So we can apply a schema um, to do that. So Confluent provides a schema registry. Um, we use Avro. Um, if you don't want to use Avro, then if you want to use Protobuf or something else, you are more than welcome. It's just that schema registry won't work um, at this time anyway. But Avro is actually very cool. Um, but the key point is that you need some mechanism, whether it's Avro or Protobuf or whatever, to allow you to reason about whether or not data whether or not data has changed on the wire, so that the order service knows that he's always going to be backwardly compatible. And that's really for me what a schema is. That's the most important property a registry gives you. Next, we can use the single writer principle. So remember we had this order that went from received and then it went to validated. Now we can imagine it goes to order completed. So what we kind of want to do, ideally, is locate all of the logic that, trans that takes a particular entity forwards and we want to locate that in a single service so that it is the only thing that can write an order, progress an order forwards. Like most of these things, we don't have to do this, but this gives us a couple of, of nice properties. Um, well, the first one is that it allows us to reason about consistency in a single place. Um, and the second one is that it actually makes things like schema migration when you, when you need to change schemas much easier. So in this, in this instance, we effectively have a, a RESTful service up at the end and we're submitting an order at T1 and you can imagine it kind of comes through here. The order service is the single, is, has, um, is the single writer, but all of these other services are effectively working at different points in time. And because they're working at different points in time, if we isolate the consistency concern, 
the fact that that order has a, a state change in time in a single service, then we can manage this in a distributed architecture. So a couple of reasons for doing this, it creates a local consistency point, because in a big distributed architecture, we often don't have a single consistency point. So a good example of this is, say you're globally replicated. Right? So imagine your services exist across multiple geographies. It's like you probably don't want to write back to a single database in one region. Um, and it also makes schema upgrades easier if this one service owns how that particular thing is mutated in time. So six is we can store data inside the log. Um, so messaging, the nice thing about Kafka is it's messaging that remembers. We can store these very large data sets, so we can literally just keep a data set inside Kafka if we want to. So for example, we might keep the data set of um, customer information so that when we start a new service, let's say we're going to build some new service. I think we've got one here. Yeah, there we go. So let's say we build a new service which does repricing. Right, so it's, it's going to um, work out whether or not we need to change the price of iPads as people buy them with supply and demand. If that needs the product catalog, we can build that service really quickly because the data set, both the product data set lives inside Kafka, but also obviously this stream of orders is something that we can subscribe to. So this kind of makes the architecture very pluggable. So we can use it as this kind of single source of truth. And this really relates back to this point that in a services architecture, where you have many different services, it's actually not the data that sits inside the service that matters so much. It's the data that they share. Because that's what everyone else is using. So if we do store data sets inside the log, then we have to think about how we query them. Like, how do you query a log? Right? It doesn't have a queryable interface. Um, Literally, all you can do is listen to events as they arrive, or you can rewind and read the whole thing, or read from a certain offset. And the way we go about this is by moving data to code. So that should sound a bit strange, hopefully, because it is a slightly strange thing to do. For many, many years, we have moved code to data. Right? Databases are all about the idea that we put our data inside a database and then we move our code, our SQL, to our database and it does the computation. Um, in reality, there are many use cases where you actually do want to move data to code. And again, this is to do with locality. So a good example of this is if you build like a web application, um, you're probably going to have, uh, you're going to use a bunch of caching over your data tier. And your caching is actually doing that it's providing a, a mechanism to effectively move data to your code and then kind of keep it there. So a lot of things we're going to be talking about here are really evolutions of this idea of caching. But caching is effectively more declarative. We can be much more specific about where data ends up in different services within our architecture. So let's say, for example, um, we have stock. Uh, this, this is the an information which is available inside the warehouse. We might decide to move that data set from Kafka, or, and originally the whatever stock service, um, into the order service. So we're actually going to move the whole data set. Um, key thing about moving a data set is it's a bit like caching, um, but we're actually going to take the whole thing. One optimization is that we typically only take the data that we need. So let's say, why does the, if the order service needs stock information, it's because it needs to know what, how many iPads there are available in the warehouse. So to know how many iPads there are in the warehouse, I actually only need two pieces of information. I need to know the product identifier, which is probably like a long or a string or something. And I need to know another maybe long or integer, which is the amount of data, the amount of iPads that I have. So we can actually take these relatively small data sets. And actually, the process of doing this is a lot of it is about optimizing for the data that we move. So when we move data, if we move data to a service, 
right, this idea of pushing data around the network, the, the ecosystem, we have to be a, a little bit um, careful about a couple of things. First one is that um, obviously Kafka scales really well. You get incredible flow throughput. It runs network limited. So network doesn't tend to be a bottleneck so much, certainly not for like business systems. It is a bottleneck in big data systems. Um, but even, even in those, um, actually indexing tends to be the thing that takes the time. So whenever you create an index, it's the act of creating that index that tends to dominate your performance. That tends to be your, your point, where, the point where you bottleneck. So we can use the log instead of a database. So this, this is a, um, so in this instance, we would basically take these reserve stocks. We might have um, stock service and we have reserve stocks. And we're actually going to effectively mutate data. This is, this is event sourcing. Um, and we're going to journal. Um, when an order comes in, we're going to reserve that iPad so that nobody else can take that iPad. And we can store that back in Kafka. So finally, just on this, on this idea of data movement, I said streaming platforms optimize for data movement. And they do that because they have standby replicas, disk checkpoints, and compacted topics. These are three mechanisms which just kind of help you deal with this problem of um, not having to load large data sets on startup. So almost at the end now. So we've got the nine is we can you tie all of these things together with transactions. So that kind, of, that kind of event sourcing model where we're actually mutating state inside the order service, we're updating um, our reserved iPads will actually create a number of events. You have an no, you event coming in, you'd commit an offset, you validate the order, you'd reserve the iPad. And Kafka provides a transactional guarantee that wraps all of that. If you're writing to Kafka, right? If you call out to a database or send an email, then all bets are off. So just like a database, the transactional guarantees only live inside the service. So we, we can wrap a transaction around all that stuff. So finally, we can bridge this sync async divide. So this is a kind of a more a fuller ecosystem of the thing that we've been talking about. So on the left hand side, we have a post and a get, simple rest service. Behind that, we have a load balancer and we have um, a set of uh, three instances of, of the order service. And this is bridging this synchronous divide. I want to post an order and I want to get an order back. And it's bridging it into this ecosystem which is all event driven. So the fraud service, the order detail service, the inventory service, these things are all running highly available and they're all event driven. So there's a sort of flow of events which is flowing around that way. Each, we can just scale this out to as many services as we need. They'll all run concurrently and highly availably. They'll evolve this, this these basically do validation. Um, and then back, in that orders view on the bottom left hand side, that's where we're basically, we'll, we'll start to build up um, a view of the various different orders which, which the, get the get request will respond to. And we can do this all in a kind of non, in a sort of blocking way, which allows us to read our own rights if we want to. So in this example, um, uh, you can find the code for this online. Um, it's on the uh, Confluent Kafka Streams examples. I think there's a reference at the end. And we have this as a sort of sample microservices ecosystem, which evolves in order forwards. And then we can scale this out to larger ecosystems um, where we have many different services and we're able to push data into different services. We can even scale this to global ecosystems. So if we're spanning data from, so uh, we can move data from New York, London, Tokyo. And that's kind of one of the beauty, that's kind of the beauty of an event-driven model is it doesn't really care where the data is, whether or not it's, you know, on another, in another geography, on a handheld device, on a, a mobile phone, etc. So, good architecture, to my mind, is actually not so much about drawing something on a whiteboard. It's actually very hard to draw a good architecture on a whiteboard, or at least it's hard to reason about a good architecture on a whiteboard, because it's a very static thing. And actually, the essence of good architecture, to my mind, is this idea that systems need to be able to evolve in time. Just like we know the software needs to evolve in time. And we do things like test and 
you know, modularize our code and use continuous integration. So it's really important that we actually apply this idea of making an architecture evolutionary. Request-driven is absolutely something that we need. We always need the request-driven paradigm, particularly for dealing with UIs and, and things like that. There's many times when that's the right protocol to use. But we also want to think about leveraging this duality of events. The fact that we have notification and data replication, this ability to push, notify as an event, but also that ability to move data from one service to another. And streaming provides this kind of unique mechanism for dealing with these data sets as they move in real time and embedding that into an API, which you can embed inside your services or if you're off the JVM, you use KSQL. So event-driven services broadcast events, retain them in the log, evolve the event stream with simple streaming functions. Right, so we're literally just going to attach a function which takes an event and, and moves it forwards, enriches it, and makes it become something new. Recasting the event stream into views so this is how, we, because we, when we move into that asynchronous model, we need to get back to the synchronous model again. How do we get back again? We recast those events back into views, which allow us to then query them. So that's, that's basically CQRS. And we can do this with the Confluence streaming platform. And um, that's essentially all I had to say. Um, thank you very much. Um, my time is up. And um, if anyone has any questions, do we have time for questions now? Or? You want to see? Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. If you'd like to ask a question afterwards, I'll be around for the rest of what's left of today. So I'll be happy to answer questions about this um, or anything else uh, Kafka-related. And there's also, if any of these, in, these ideas were, interested, uh, were interesting, check out the blog series. Um, there's actually a new one came out today, which includes that example, which I didn't have enough time to really go into, with the... Um, uh, the streaming order service and it has references to all the code so you can download it and play with it if you want to. So um, yeah, anyone got any questions? Oh, there's one here. Oh. Yeah, so the question was, um, is the order only guaranteed within a partition? Yes. The answer to that question is yes. So if you want global ordering, you use a single partition. But that will be fully replicated and fault tolerant, but your, your throughput will be limited to one machine. Um, if anyone else has questions, just come down and ask. Thanks.